Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome to Field of Glory Empires. For those of you joining me for the first time ever, my name is Sabouts and if you're returning to my channel for another series, I'd like to welcome you back. Well, Field of Glory Empires, not to be confused with its cousins, which were Field of Glory and Field of Glory 2. Uh, the Empires version of the game is actually a grand strategy game, unlike the other ones which were more turn-based uh, battle simulator games where you took control of armies. In this one, you're actually going to be taking control of an entire empire. And that's where the grand strategy portion of the game comes in. Now, this game actually takes place around 310 uh, BCE. So, basically, right before the uh, height of the Roman Empire. I shouldn't say the height of the Roman Empire, but definitely uh, starting out during the early days of the Roman Empire. And it, uh, you can play a grand campaign, which goes on past that. Now, what we're going to be viewing here is a little bit earlier version of the game before its final release in a few days. So we may run into some bugs and everything, and I know that some of the campaigns and scenarios are not here, but I thought it'd be cool to, to visit it before it comes out and see all of the neat things it has to offer. If you're particularly fond of grand strategy games during this time period in particular, uh, this game does a very good job at actually playing everything out. And I'll explain more as we get in. I don't want to get too nitty gritty into the mechanics here on the on the main screen so once we get into the game and as I progress through things I'll kind of explain how it works so uh, hold on one second there we go so this is a new camp or a new campaign or scenario here which I think they just came out with um, they're kind of releasing some scenarios here and there um, even though the game's not fully out yet, just for people to test. But uh, here we've got the Grand Campaign. So it says, uh, Alexander the Great has been dead for a de decade. His successors, uh, Diodachi, are fighting in the East over the right to wear his mantle or carve out their own realm. In the West, conflicts between Rome and Carthage looks to be inevitable. The current year is 310 BCE. History awaits you. And if you're not familiar with BCE or CE, it's pretty much the same as BC and AD. It's just, um, I don't know, more current. It's just something a lot of people do. Um, this is before current era and this is current era. So this would be like before Christ and AD, which is after the day of the Lord or whatever it is. So that if that if don't let that confuse you. Um, so yeah, this, this plays through these entire years here. We're going to do the grand campaign. Um, I'm going to butcher a ton of names in this, <laughs> so you're just going to have to bear with me. My, uh, oh, my history of the, this era is very rusty. So AI difficulty, we'll just stick with balanced for now since it is uh, pretty early on in the game's, well, I wouldn't say early in the game's development, but since, uh, we're just trying it out. And I've loaded into the game already before on my own time and kind of messed around with the controls and practiced a little bit so that way I could have a general concept of what I'm doing and that way I can better explain to you guys what you're looking at once we start playing through. And I've already selected a country I want to play and I'll uh, go over them as well. But here we are on the country selection screen. You can see that there is no lack of countries you can select to play uh, during this time period. It goes all the way up here into you know what is present day United Kingdom all the way down Spain um, into northern Africa. I'm kind of skipping, you know, where things like the Sahara Desert would be. And uh, we come all the way over here, uh, just barely touching uh, the outside of India, which I believe is actually what this is. Look at that. We've got a little bit of a, we got an elephant there. And uh, yeah, so that's kind of our playing area. Now, uh, most of the action is going to be taking place, of course, in areas like the uh, Mediterranean. Uh, we've got Italy as well. What is present-day Italy as a major place? So here's Rome and what they look like during this time period. This is right around the time when they were going to war with a lot of the nations around them, especially rubbing shoulders with Carthage. And I think this is right before a lot of the major battles they had with Carthage. Um, even Syracuse here is is still uh, kicking around. So we've got uh, over here uh, major nations, which is all of the big players during this time period. We've got remarkable nations, which is all nations that are kind of big players, but not as big as the major. And then coming down here, we've got other factions, which are basically just the other, I guess the anything but major or remarkable nations. Um, a lot of them being the 
uh, different uh, gothic tribes up to the north and uh, different stuff like that. So it's pretty cool. There's a lot of really neat things to play. Uh, we've even got uh, some of the the Greek nations here. They're kind of in the decline right now. Um, Sparta. Um, what is uh, would be Athens here. Uh, Macedonia. Stuff like that. Um, I believe Constantinople. Before it was Constantinople. So it's kind of cool. The uh, names here, like I said, I'm going to butcher every single one of these. So just uh, go ahead and, you know... Uh, Buckle yourself in your seat. Try not to yell at your screen too much and, you know, refrain from standing up so you don't injure yourself. Because uh, th uh, these are just, uh, some of these are really hard to pronounce for me. But uh, this is what we're going to be playing as. And now, I've heard the pronunciation a couple of different ways. And I've read a little bit about the actual tribe on Wikipedia and some stuff before I launch this up here. But uh, if, I'm, if I'm correct, then I believe the pronunciation of this is the uh, Dachia. But I've heard Dacia, Dacia, I've heard some other crap. We'll just go with Dacia here. So the Dacia was isolated at the start of this era, but gradually expanded towards the Danube, maintaining contact with the uh, Getes, their eastern cousins. Set up in a hilly and mountainous region, the initial population was low, but the vast iron and silver deposits became the basis of their wealth. And one of the reasons for the Romans trying to subjugate Dacia they developed a rather sophisticated culture and erected a lot of fortresses and defensive positions to protect their kingdom. By 44 BCE, they ruled a large area stretching from the Black Sea to modern-day Bohemia. The Roman conquest in 106 uh, current era fragmented their rule. So, eventually the Romans did conquer them, but it took a lot of time because of the massive amounts of fortresses they were able to build. So if you actually look at gameplay here, and this is really cool and I think it's really interesting on this screen here. Some of the things here is it'll tell you first of all what the average difficulty is and how interesting the nation is to play. So some of these, difficulty 3 out of 5 and interest 3 out of 5. If you click on Rome, difficulty 3 out of 5, interest 5 out of 5. Um, and some of these other ones here, Tarentum here, uh, 4 out of 5, difficulty, difficulty 5 out of 5. I know Syracuse is 5 and 5, so that would be really fun to play at some point. Carthage there, 4 and 5. So there's all sorts of really interesting things here. I think Sparta's 3-3, three, three, no, 4-5. But I thought that this would be a good nation to play because we're not really starting out near anybody, so we kind of have the ability to expand and form a good-sized empire before we start running into issues and before the Roman Empire eventually expands out and uh, we go to war with them. So it's a good nation to play well, as we try to get the ropes of the game. And each one of these will also give you a little bit of a gameplay. So kind of just explaining to you some of the uh, unique challenges you're going to face playing these different empires. And uh, what to expect as you play through the game. And maybe give you some tips on what can help you out. So in particular for us, it says, uh, Dechia was isolated at the start of this era. Oh no, I'm sorry. That's, I already read that. Initially, you would need to expand into the various tribal regions that surround your state. As Dechia did historically... Fight, fighting the Celt, uh, the uh, Celts many times. Uh, also, you will find yourself the target of initial Galatian invasion. While easy to expand, the local regions are initially poor and will take some time to be productive. So a lot of these areas around here uh, are going to be poor of different resources we're going to need. And we're going to have to build them up, which will be a little bit of a handicap for us. An early decision is whether to push into Thrace, which is rich but may be difficult. Or stay east of the Danube. Uh, the newbie, uh, conquering weaker provinces. Your unique feature is your fortresses, which are made of no less than four levels of complexity and defenses. Cheap and interesting, they will make your nation a tough nut to crack for any invader. The last level is a national unique fortress that provides great bonuses in production, plus a master smith feature, which will upgrade one of your units per turn for free. Over time, the Chia can conquer the world, or say, the priest kings. So that's kind of cool. Um, we get a... Uh, a unique fortress, which gives us a master smith feature. That's kind of neat. So every, or not every nation, but a lot of nations have their own little unique units, uh, buildings, and all sorts of cool stuff. So it's kind of uh, deep in that complexity. But I'm going to tell you guys, once we get into the actual mechanics of the game, you're going to love it. Because there's some really cool stuff they've done with this game. I'm unbelievably impressed. Okay, so we've got the Belkanic Tradition. This is actually going to give us a bonus of 5 XP when a unit is created, so that's kind of cool. It applies only to heavy infantry, infantry, light infantry, and skirmishers, and reduction in money cost by 10% conditional. I like that a lot. <laughs> Excuse me. Oh, my goodness. We get tribe, so our government modifier is a tribe. 
Um, it gives us a manpower bonus of 15%. That's also pretty good. An industrious focus. So we actually get an infrastructure bonus of 20%, but a health penalty of 5%. Some of this is going to make a lot more sense once we get in there. Let's get started. They are a remarkable faction, by the way. All right. And we're in the game. <sighs> okay. So here we are. And uh, there's going to be a lot on this screen. Actually, not too much information, but there's a decent enough amount. And once we start actually getting into uh, various other things like the government screen, um, there might be an overwhelming amount of information, but I promise you it is fairly easy once we start going over it. Now, this is going to be my first time doing a full campaign. I did do a little bit of a practice run and I've read up a bit on the game uh, just to kind of and watch some of the tutorials that the developers have released just to kind of brush myself up on how to play or at least have a general idea of what I'm doing. So uh, I'll do my best to explain things, but I'll explain them as I go along instead of just trying to explain them all at once. Uh, so I, you guys don't get overwhelmed here. But basically, this is our empire and this is our empire screen. We've got our current leader. He is age 40 and he is in good health. Age 40, that's pretty old for that time period. So he's in good health, but for how long? Uh, this ruler is a decent administrator. He is able to restore efficiency in the state and people believe in him. So a decadence re re uh, gain reduction by 5% and he gives a loyalty bonus of 5. It's actually really good. Usimas. Okay. So we've got progress uh, and decadence. So basically what you need to know about this screen is we've got the historical culture value of our empire and we've got decadence. Oh boy. So how do I explain this without over without uh, going nuts here? So the easiest way to explain this. Your historical culture value is like um, different uh, historical things you do. It can be decisions. It could be uh, buildings you build that give you historical value. Um, that adds up over time. And current 23 loyalty weighted culture production. So basically it averages out your loyalty with your average of historical over a course of a certain amount of years and then takes that number gives you an average number and when you divide that by what your decadence is that gives you a ratio your decadence is like can be all sorts of things your nation size structures events uh status age penalty there national modifiers decadence is like a, a nation in decline hcv can consider that like you know, a nation on the rise kind of thing or like different things you do to make your nation prominent. Um, so during this time period, lots of nations are rising, some are falling. You know, we've got a lot of the Greek nations that are starting to collapse, uh, nations like Sparta and such that are just not doing good. Um, they're starting to become older nations and eventually going into a decline. So decadence would be like that decline that's happening to a nation. And there's various things that can cause that to happen. Nation size being a big one, but there's other things as well that'll happen. Now, um, the, the, the interesting thing about this is obviously nation size playing an effect on this. So generally, there's a decent balance between smaller and larger nations. And I thought this was a really unique mechanic that the developers came up with to kind of help balance some stuff out. So if I understand this correctly, basically you're going to get more decadence uh, depending on how large your nation is. So a larger nation is going to be harder to control. Pretty unique when compared to a game like say Europa Universalis 4, where once you your nation hits a certain size, you just, other than like paying more money to maintain that nation, for the most part, it's controllable. But in this game, if you become too large too quickly and you don't balance that out with lots of historical culture value or loyalty, your nation may find itself going the uh, decadence route, maybe potentially uh, going into a decline. And uh, we'll get more into that as we kind of play around with this system more and we learn more about it. Um, so that, that's just something kind of interesting. I thought that was unique. Um, I don't fully understand all of this yet, but I've got a general idea. Basically, um, I know that it gives you this ratio transfers over here. Um, this ratio places you in rank nine among all nations. So you are in the first tier, rank 25 and above and can progress. We get a 40% chance to receive a progress token. So these up here are progress tokens. We don't have any currently down here. These would be uh, decadence tokens. 
or uh, I think uh, aging tokens is what they're called. So if you get five progress tokens, then you go into a new age, essentially. Consider it like a golden age. If you get uh, five um, of the aging tokens, then you go backwards in an age. So say like right now we are a stable civilization level two. Let's see. What are we here actually? We are a stable industrious tribal chiefdom. So if we get five of those tokens and they'll be represented around here, then we will become a glorious industrial tribal chiefdom. If we get five aging tokens, then we become an old industrious tribal chiefdom. And if you keep getting agent, uh, if you keep getting these glorious uh, tokens here, these progress tokens, then you get all sorts of bonuses when you become like a glorious, consider it like a golden age. If you get the aging tokens, you become an old industrious tribal chiefdom, then you get uh, some negative modifiers. If you keep going backwards, you can eventually erupt into civil war and all sorts of stuff like that. Okay, I said I wouldn't over-explain everything, so that's some of the stuff there. Um, there's other information on this screen here. Uh, these were the modifiers we had read, um, different uh, decisions we have, objectives, and national traits, which there is a lot of them. But we've also gone over a lot of this one, so that's all of that there for now. Our strategy age is currently age 15, which means that we have been in the stable, industrious, tribal chiefdom age for 15 years. Now, each turn up here in the top right is a year. So we're on turn one, year 310. If I click this and end our turn, we'll go to year 311, and it, it'll play out the entire turn almost uh, like a year. So as opposed to, say, EU4, something like that, where it's kind of pause and, and uh, play mechanics, this here is actually more turn-based. All right, so up at the top, we've got our money and our income. So how much we currently have stored and what we're getting a turn. Right now we're getting plus three. It's pretty pretty poor. We've got manpower generation. So we've got currently 100 men ready to join for, uh, our forces and 26 joining every year. We've got uh, different things like diplomacy, which will come in effect later on. And we've got a ledger here, which will just give us an idea of some of our regions. We can also look at uh, population, military, trade goods, armies, and all sorts of other useful information. We don't need this yet, but it'll be valuable later on. And then over here, we have metal production and legacy changes. These are both very important for a lot of reasons. And if we actually click here on our home uh, province, is this a province, I guess? Not sure if it's actually, I guess we'll just call them province. No, I feel like this is a province. I guess these are just lands essentially. So if we click on our homeland here, we get, um, yeah, because that's the province technically. So that would be a province. This would be just a land. Um, so if we if we look at our home one here, we've got a couple different resources. So we've got food, infrastructure, money, and culture. And then in the back, we have manpower, metal, and equipment. Now you can look at these four, uh, these ones up here in the front as basically being um, things that each province produces. I'm sorry, I'm going to call them provinces. Each land produces. So here in our capital land, it's producing plus 12 food, uh, plus 17 infrastructure, and plus one gold. If we look at this one, plus one food, minus one infrastructure, but plus one money. And over here, plus seven food, plus 12 infrastructure, plus 25 culture. We actually got some culture buildings here, so we're getting some stuff there. This is our capital province, by the way, not this one. Damn it, capital land, whatever province. We're calling it provinces now. And then this, this is just a whole province. Okay, so... Yeah, that's where we're at. Now we can alter these. You can see we've got different populations here. We've got some Celtic slaves, but we also have uh, Balkanic citizens. And we can dra drag and drop these to produce uh, various resources. So right now here, if we were to move, let's say we go into our home territory. So we're, we're, we're it's costing us money right now, minus seven gold. That's pretty poor. You can see we've only got plus three. This is probably part of the problem. So if we were to take one of these citizens and move him down, it would be uh, less food, minus five food, but we would get plus six gold. So now plus nine. That's a little bit better. But it's only plus two food. You can see the population here is going to grow. And if he's up here, it grows in 12 turns. If we move him down, it'll, it grows in 40. That's 40 years. It's a pretty long time. But I think it's worth waiting. We do have some infrastructure here. Um, so consider food to be like food for your 
for your population and, and to grow. Infrastructure is like what it takes to build buildings. So if we move people out of infrastructure, buildings here, which are on the left, by the way, they'll take longer to build. And uh, culture is used, you generate culture and that's used to um, help with your your uh, historical culture value. So that's pretty useful. And we might need to play with that a little bit on, but we've started with the tribal council. This gives us uh, 10 culture and 12 manpower. That's pretty good. And it's considered a national wonder. It also has two garrisons here. So if we're under attack, these garrisons will help defend. And we get a bonus of 15 XP when a unit is created here. We also started with a Perceptor House. The elites are formed there. With better education, they can hopefully be more virtuous. Provides a moderate culture bonus, but needs Papyrus. Also slightly reduces Decadence. Oh, this is a really good building. So Decadence Reduction. We need Papyrus, so we don't have any Papyrus. And it does give us uh, Culture 3. This is a nice building. I like this. Um, the Decadence Reduction is really good. So papyrus, missing cost. So we could see if there's any papyrus nearby. It'd be under the trade details screen, I believe. We should be able to see uh, what kind of things we want to trade. Missing trade goods is papyrus. Um, so let's see. So if we want to see what we need to trade. All right, well, I'll have to mess with this. I'm trying to remember how to bring that up. But either way, this, this shows you here. Manufactured trade goods. So some of the stuff here we've got, we've got natural trade goods. So we've actually, we actually have gold. Do we have a gold mine? I didn't see it. Sawmill, Hunter Lodge, a crafter district. Okay, so we don't have a gold mine here. This is missing the papyrus. So it's costing us 15 gold to run this, okay, and then we have gold here, which is natural trade good, manufactured trade goods and imported trade goods we don't have. So we're not importing any trade goods, we're not manufacturing anything, but we do have gold here. Structures using this trade good as a bonus. So there's a lot of structures that use these as a bonus. We haven't built any yet. And then structures needing this trade good, a gold mine, a bank, a Midas treasury. We haven't built any of those yet. But if we do build any of those, uh, then we'll be able to get these things. So those those are going to things be things we're going to want to look out for. Here we go. Trade goods overlay. All right. So here's what we've got uh, around us. We currently have gold in both of these provinces. So we have the potential to be a very rich country if we can access these gold stores. We are not accessing them currently. They are here as a natural trade good, but they're not being used. Currently, we are manufacturing lumber here. And that is because I believe the, hunt, the sawmill right here. So the sawmill, it produces lumber, a high yield but costly infrastructure, producing, uh, producing structure, I'm sorry, it's a high yield but costly infrastructure producing structure that can only be built in regions with forests. Generates lumber used by wheel makers and shipyards. So there is forest here. We can hover over and see at the bottom of this, it says forest with a land cost of three. Um, a lot of these have different things like forest here. We've got mountainous terrain here, uh, forest, mountain. So a lot of those not only are important based off of the type of resources you can harvest out of the these lands here, but it also has an effect on uh, on different uh, battle outcomes and such, and that'll play later on as we start going to war with some of the tribes around us. Now, uh, yeah, so we've got gold. <laughs> the gold's going to make us very rich, and that's pretty exciting. We do have some salt here. Um, we've got some iron, which is also going to be very beneficial for crafting weapons and uh, different equipment later on. Even more iron if we keep expanding this way. Um, we've got furs on the outside here in these forests. We've got wild beasts. Not really sure how that could help us just yet. Uh, horses would be useful though, and coal. Figs, more iron, more iron. And nuts and seeds, nuts and seeds. Not sure how that would be useful. More copper, iron expanding up into here. I will say papyrus is not something we have any of, and that's going to be a problem because we're currently paying for it. So basically what happens is if you take a look back at this here, this needs papyrus to properly operate. This perceptor house does not work without papyrus. Now that's not to say that it's not working right now. We are still getting the culture boost 
and we're getting the decadence reduction, but we are paying because Papyrus is missing. It is costing us 15 gold a year to operate this building. So if we can find Papyrus, then we can add 15 gold to this and up our gold acquiring, which would be huge. Now, I will say I'm not seeing Papyrus on the map, so it may be a manufactured good, and I would say that it probably is a manufactured good. I just don't know how it's uh, how it's manufactured, so we're going to have to find out. There's a couple different ways we could do that. So let's take a look at uh, different buildings here under construction. So we currently start with some forts here. We got a public works, a crafter district. This gives us six income per turn plus a commerce bonus of 10%. Okay. The public works, works gives us an infrastructure bonus. Over here, we have somebody currently, we have a Bel Belkinic slave and he's in infrastructure. Uh, may not be that useful. This place is going to grow in four turns, which is excellent. So we'll keep this guy here under the food production. Um, let's see. Manpower minus two. Okay, that's fine. Bonus of five food minus two manpower from wild beasts. Okay, so this is interesting. So if there's wild beasts nearby, then we get a bonus of five food. But you lose two manpower. Okay. Okay. Now, this, this province here does not have wild beasts in it, as we can see, but the province next to it has wild beasts, and even though we don't control this province, you, for, for a building to, for one of these bonuses to be in effect, you only have to be next to a province that has what you need. So, the way you build buildings may affect, uh, may be affected by the resources that are around it. So it's something to keep in mind. Now this one here, growth in 30 turns and um, it's not producing hardly any infrastructure and only one food. This is a very struggling province and it's probably not going to grow for some time. I don't even know how we could grow this because if I move him over here to try to help infrastructure, then the, the province starves. Hmm. I guess we'll just have to wait till it grows because I can't build anything because we don't have any infrastructure. Uh. All right, so we'll uh, just let this hang out for now. All right, so let's go ahead and queue a building up to be built. And uh, we can do that here in our capital. See, no buildings under construction and the maximum number allowed is reached. So building slots three out of two. This one actually is above its building slots and uh, it won't be able to be built for a while. <clears throat> and one, it won't be able to be built until we get uh, two more populations. So there's currently three buildings here, two population. For every population, you get an extra building slot. This one's already passed one. So this one here, however, though, only has two buildings technically. Building slots two out of um, five. So the two buildings, What's taking building slots? Let's see. Staple Valley Development. This structure costs no building slots. So the Public Works does not take a building slot. I don't believe the fort does either. Or maybe it does. But there's certain buildings that don't take building slots. Crafter District. Slot usage, zero. Slot usage, zero. And... Uh, I'm guessing this takes a slot. So the fort must not take a slot, but it doesn't say anything. Either way, so we're only using two out of five. So we can build a building here. Now when we go into here, it gives you a random amount of buildings that you can build. And you can structure, you can shuffle the structure proposals if you want. But uh, these are always random when you come into here. So they're not always going to be the same. Now we do have a monument here. Pillar, arc, gate, monuments to the glory of an often despotic ruler will generate culture over time with some decadence from the personality cult has the extra merit or lure of using no structure lot. So this would give us a decadent increase, which we kind of don't want, but it does give us 10 culture and uh, it does uh, mi minus one for infrastructure. We've got a tannery here. It needs cattle. 
And it uh, it uh, lo let's see, loses money here. We've got stables that needs horses. Uh, trading required because we don't have horses yet. We, we, we are going to try to get some. Uh, gives us a bonus to infrastructure. Does cost a lot of money, but it gives us a bonus to equipment. Equipment's used to produce troops. We'll get into more of this as we move on. Brickwork. Cheap structure that will greatly benefit from local or imported stone. So bonus of five infrastructure from stone. Missing though. We don't have any stone currently. We've got an herbalist. Uh, easy to set up and maintain. It provides only a small bonus that will help maintain the farmers in good health, thus allowing more young men to be enlisted. So this helps with health, which health is really good. And it also helps with increasing our manpower, which you never have too much manpower. We also have the shepherd house. So this produces wool. It would give us five food, but it's minus one infrastructure. I think I'm going to go for the shepherd house. I want the bonus to food because this has growth in 40 turns since I had to move somebody down to money to help kind of make sure we are producing some income. So this will allow us to grow a little bit quicker if we get that. Plus giving us the access to wool could be useful. Do we have any stone nearby? I don't, I don't see any stone. There's some all the way down here. That could take a while to expand to. I was hoping there'd be some stone closer by. We could always trade for it later on if we had to. But in terms of getting it, don't think it's going to happen for a bit. Oh, there's some wool there. But we'll be producing our own wool soon. Flax, we even got some fish out here. All right, perfect. So that is, uh, that's that there. Um, now we've got our army here. We can take a look at that. So currently we have some heavy infantry, some Thracian slingers, and some warriors. Kind of a small army. We are being led by uh, Gamar here. He's got an offensive rating of one and a defense rating of one. His health is excellent. He's only age 22. We've also got some other leaders we could pick. Uh, Dejius here actually has an offensive rating of one and a defensive rating of two. He also is determined he gets a movement bonus. And this guy is determined movement bonus, but uh, offensive zero, defensive one. See, leader rating gives extra combat dice to units under command. I'm kind of tempted to switch over here. He's got a little bit more experience, it would seem. No, not more experience, but he's got, let's see, combat power. Oh, he's got better combat power. Oh, that's the combat power of the army. That's right. So if you switch leaders, the army does lose some combat power as they go to adjust to him. The leader uh, was not commanding any of these units the turn before. As such, all eight units suffer a penalty of one to their experience level. So they all suffer a penalty because you basically put them under a new commander and they're, they're trying to adjust to that new commander. But I definitely think we should switch because Dacius here. I like that defensive rating of two. Could be pretty useful. Um, and then the determined movement, so he gets a movement bonus. Uh, currently, this army has a food usage of four. Uh, so whatever province they're in, they're going to burn some food up. And they have a move speed of four, which means they can move all around. Um, we could recruit some more units for this as well. I'm a little nervous because this is kind of a small army, and I feel like we need some more units. We do have a lot of equipment, so we could probably go ahead and do that. Here's our units here. Now, some of these are definitely a lot more expensive than others. Uh, Mercenary Recruitment Center. And we can't recruit half this stuff because we don't have stables or training grounds or barracks, etc., etc. But we can do regular infantry. You can see that they're going to cost us um, 27 gold right out the gate, uh, 20 manpower, 4 metal, and 20 equipment. Now, we're only producing 5 metal a turn. We do have the equipment, or at least we're about to gain 31 equipment. Um... But they also have an upkeep, and that upkeep is going to be 8 gold and 4 manpower. Eh, that's a lot of upkeep. 8 gold almost handicaps us right off in the beginning. So we may be better off waiting a little bit till we can sort of help our gold situation out. This one here is going to grow in 4 turns, so after that we could um, not... Let's see, we won't be able to get a new building, but we could potentially throw somebody into gold here and uh, up the income and then get a new unit. Over here, population growth in 30 turns. This place is going to 
suffer for quite some time. Only one building slot as well. <sighs> 30 turns till it grows. Oh, this could be a problem. But uh, we'll probably just let it ride. Now we could attack some of these areas nearby here. Uh, we haven't gotten any objectives yet. Uh, but eventually sometimes you'll get objectives of where uh, your, your nation essentially wants you to conquer. So it does consider this to be the, the province here. So we probably want the whole province. I'm not sure if you get bonuses for taking the whole province. Uh, what do we got actually for trade resources? So we've got salt. Uh, we do got iron, which we're going to want to go for. Uh, nuts and seeds. Not not uh, as important for some of these, but I think the iron would be useful. Uh, we'll defend with approximately six units. So only six units here. Uh, I think uh, we should be able to take some of these. They're, they're pretty weak. It is a forest. And it does have available food of three with a forage value of four. All right. So I think we're going to go for this. You can see that there's uh, some citizens here already and some uh, slaves. So we'll start. I, th I believe you'll get these citizens when you take it over, which would be useful because if we can up our gold production, that'll help. So, hmm. Let's see, some of these guys have different... Uh, they operate differently. Based off of, they get like different abilities here. Is there anybody? I want to see their abilities. All right, let's do this. So he's a besieger. And this is all his combat stats. Um, what else did we have? We didn't have any cavalry, I don't believe. We've just got the slingers, the warriors, and the heavy infantry. That is a, let's see, is that, I believe that's our unique heavy infantry unit. So, let's see. They have clumsy, so active only in forested, swampy, and mountainous terrains, which this is a forest. Uh, they will take an attack and defense penalty uh, in that area. We do have some planes over here if we wanted to go after them in the beginning, uh, if we were worried about that. Let's see, what kind of trade goods do we have here? Nothing really in these areas. Uh, do I want to go for the forest? I think so. We will take the hit with with Clumsy, but I think we can man it. We've got eight units in this. We'll be fighting six. No matter where we go, we're going to fight six units. But we are taking a hit because we switched leaders. So why don't we go fight in this planes first? And then we can uh, eventually come down into here. We can come down into here and uh, fight that once the troops have adjusted to their new leader. And then we won't be taking the uh, penalty of one to the experience level. And they should uh, get some experience fighting these guys and that'll probably make them veterans. They'll be a little bit tougher and I won't be as concerned about the clumsy. I might make some new units as well. Um, next turn. I don't want to do it this turn because of our gold production, but we'll see if we can we'll see if we can help that out. All right, so we're going to leave it off here since we're out of time. I know we haven't even ticked on turn one yet, but there's a lot to go over and definitely was a lot to explain. Uh, there'll be more to explain in the next couple episodes, but definitely a game I'm excited about. And I hope you guys are excited to uh, see it as well. It does come out in a few days, so you can check the Steam page out. It'll be down below in the description of the video. Also, if this is your first time at my channel, consider subscribing. It really helps support me, and it also helps you guys out because you get notifications when new videos drop for games just like... Uh, Fields of Glory Empires, so you'll want to keep up on that. And don't forget to leave a like as well. Support the channel, support the video. Most importantly, lets me know what content you guys like to see. With that being said, I want to thank you all for joining me. I hope that you've enjoyed it. I look forward to seeing you next time.